Jeff, I had a couple questions at the break about installing your rain gauge. There are actually good directions and instructions on where to locate your rain gauge. You want it to be away from a building. You want it to be not to, you know, have any kind of a tree nearby that would influence the, you know, your readings. Um, so pretty much on a post out in the open where um, you're going to catch as much as you can and have an accurate reading. Um, okay, so we have our third speaker, is Jeff Shalau. He's our county agent, county director. Um, and uh, he's going to be talking about the importance of soil when you're thinking about passive rainwater harvesting. That can be the place where the water is stored is in your soil. And um, so I'm going to turn it over to Jeff, and then we'll, um, after he's done, we'll have the vendors come up and have you talk in front of the group for a few minutes about what you want <coughs> locally. And then I definitely want to remind everybody, I'll remind you again, that we do want to collect the evaluations before we break for lunch. And we'll, we'll also want to, uh, I'll get together with Chris on where our rendezvous spot will be for this afternoon when we get back together. Excellent. All right, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jessica. Well, I, I'm going to be batting clean up here, and um, I'll try and fill in some of the gaps as we've gone along, and uh, I'll give you my take on this stuff. Um, I'm really all for the passive side of it. I don't have a lot of infrastructure on, on my things. Uh, if, if I wanted to, I could, but most of my opportunity really lies on uh, I've got slope, I'm in Prescott, and I, I still measure. Most of my plantings are uh, native landscaping. I've got some fruit trees that it would be nice to be able to water at some point in time. But I'm thinking I want to direct the water to them when we get rainfall events, rather than, I, I'm the kind of guy, I can install something, <clears throat> but I'm not going to have a whole lot of time to maintain it once it gets installed. And, and there's maybe a few of you around like that. And <clears throat> the passive side of it, really works nicely if you have that kind of lifestyle like I do. But I'm kind of like a shark, you know, I have to keep moving forward or I'm, you know, I'm going to die. Uh, and and uh, the things that I leave behind me, you know, I've forgotten about a long time ago. I try and keep up with them, but if I install something that requires a lot of maintenance, I'm going to miss the maintenance is what my point is, just because I'm so busy with other things. One of the things that I thought I'd just throw out there too is, um, you know, we've talked about pavers and we've talked about mulches, and I'm going to talk more about mulches and soils. But one of the things that I think uh, doesn't get talked about much, but I've kind of discovered it works really well for me for passive rainwater harvesting, is placement of large rocks. And the water that sheets off of those rocks goes into crevices between the, them and the next rocks over. And so just by placing a lot of rocks, you reduce the amount of surface area of soil that's exposed. It's an impervious surface that's going to direct the water into the surrounding area. So basically we're talking about rainwater harvesting on this kind of a scale. And then you plant desirable plants in the crevices of, of the rocks. And at my house, I have a lot of granite. I'm in Prescott. But around here, there's a lot of other equally nice types of rock. You can actually find rocks that have lichens on them. And keep the lichens, you know, above ground. And, you know, one of the things to remember with rock is it always looks best when you bury it. And, you know, you buy a rock, a boulder that's this big and this tall, but you, only, you bury it so only this much is showing. That looks natural. When, when it's just a rock that's like plopped there, I mean, it, it doesn't have the same impact and effect to me. Uh, so, you know, some of those things are things you can think about. Um, the other, uh, let's see. Well, I just want to give another plug for Rain Long. Of course, it's one of my colleagues that uh, started the program, but it is really fun to record the rain that you get, and it's really interesting to see the spatial distribution, the differences in spatial distribution, especially of our summer rains. Right, all of us have been driving across the valley or someplace here, and you see that little thunderstorm cell way over there. Well, you can actually, if there is a rain logger that was there, they would be capturing that data. And so what, what this citizen science project is doing 
is trying to fill in the gaps in spatial distribution of our official rain gauges and get a handle on that seasonal variability across the landscape. So real researchers use that rain log data to, to look at spatial distribution of precipitation. Just throw that out there. So what is it, rainlog.org? Rainlog.org. And so, um, and there's information on rainlog.org with your rain gauge, I believe. Is there those stickers and things in there, Destiny? Yeah, so anyway, um, it's pretty easy to do. And you don't have to go to the site every day. You just go there when it rains or snows, uh, and then you fill in the zeros in between uh, when you uh, don't get rain, which is a significant portion of the year, really. So as, as this presentation says, I'm going to be talking about soils mulching and maybe a little bit about planting. But I think soils are one of the things that are often ignored uh, in these rainfall, uh, rainwater harvesting workshops that happen, you know, pretty frequently these days, actually. And so figuring out uh, the permeability of your soil and, and just whether your soil is really going to support plants. I'm sure some of you have walked around your house and said, well, I really need a tree right here. But then you start digging a hole there, and um, the hole is telling you that you might not be able to get a tree in there. And one of the rules of thumbs that I'll just throw out to you is if, if you think you're going to put a tree or a large woody shrub someplace, to dig a hole that's 12 by 12 by 12 and fill it full of water. Let that water drain, if it will, and then fill it again. And if it drains in less than 24 hours, if, if it drains in less than 24 hours, you've got hope. But hopefully it'll drain in less than 12 hours. And 12 hours is still a long time. And if it doesn't drain within 12 to 24 hours, you've probably got what's called a caliche layer under there. That's, that's what you would find here in the Verde Valley. And a caliche layer is a cemented layer. Um, it's not concrete cement, but it's native lime that's in the soil that the rainfall only moistens the soil to a certain depth over millennia. And that lime is getting rinsed through the soil down to that depth, and it cements together the aggregates that are there, and it forms a basically a concrete-like layer. Um, there are different degrees of caliche. There's some that you can break apart in your hands, but there's a, quite a bit of it that does feel like concrete. And so the idea then is if you have it and you want to improve the drainage, you're probably going to have to fracture it with something like a jackhammer or something. And you're probably not uh, going to want to bring more of that stuff to the surface than you have to. Because the soil that's been rinsed freer of the lime up above that is probably going to be more hospitable to plant growth. So you've got a lot of limestone areas here in the Verde Valley too. Um, and the, the limestone, you're going to have alkaline soils there. And so you're going to want to plant plants that are appropriate for alkaline soils. And what are those plants? Well, look around at what's growing naturally out there uh, and, and try and mimic that. There's a lot of grasses. I'm a big fan of using native and kind of quasi-native grasses to keep the soil in place, to protect the soil from raindrop impact and erosion, and so on. And grasses, perennial native grasses, there's nothing as good as those to, to really kind of hold the place there. Now, if your goals are also to grow food, such as Odessa showed, um, then, you know, you're gonna have to uh, combine your water harvesting with, uh, with cultivation and with probably mulching and with soil preparation lots of organic matter needs to get added to grow good vegetables around here and you need to add organic matter every year so compost another thing that before I launch into more technical stuff here or, or the soil is the difference between a soil amendment and a mulch and there's a lot of confusion about this amongst um, a lot of people that write about horticulture, and they use the, uh, those two words interchangeably, but really compost or soil amendment is to be incorporated into the soil. Mulch is something that's on the surface of the soil, and the mulch, <clears throat> the benefit of it, 
I'm going to talk about it as part of my presentation. But just to name a few things, it's going to reduce the damage of raindrop, raindrop impact on the soil surface, so your soil is going to stay in place. And as overland flow of water occurs, your soil is going to be protected from uh, a lot of movement that way. But also, the sun beating down, you know, the word has been tossed out today, evapotranspiration. Well, that's a big word, and uh, we might not all know what that means. But what that means is the water that's used by the plant roots to support plant growth, as well as what's evaporated from the soil surface. So if it's mulched, the evaporation part is going to be much reduced. Now, um, you know, I, we keep talking about Prescott, and the three of us that are presenting are from Prescott, but over here there are also opportunities to get wood chip type mulch. And I know uh, my friend, uh, well, there's lots of master gardeners in the room, and uh, I, I know those, all of those folks pretty well, uh, and one of them is Bill Marmaduke, who's here, and so he lives off of Salt Mine Road, and APS was doing a lot of line clearances there. So they come through, they chip up a lot of material, and then they put it in the back of their truck, and they want to take it somewhere. Well, if you can catch them at the right time, they'll take it to you, but you have to be willing to accept about eight or nine yards of it sometimes. <laughs> so, and that eight or nine yards, just so you know, is probably a pile as big as the corner of the space to get back into the dump truck. Yeah, it's a huge amount, but once you got that stuff, it's really good. But I want to caution you that those chips, you do not want to use those chips as a soil amendment. You want to keep them on the surface of the soil. They're going to tie up all your available plant, the available nitrogen the plants want if you incorporate it into the soil. So, you know, I'm talking about chipped up stuff, and so it's really good mulch if you can get a hold of it. I don't think, do they have any of it at transfer stations over here? Yeah, they, yeah. so the Camp Verde transfer station, the, the county owns a big giant chipper, and they collect woody debris at these uh, transfer station sites, and every once in a while, they'll bring this chipper through and chip all this stuff up, and then the pile of it lays there, so you gotta go and load it up yourself, but it's free. So, just a couple of, yes? Well, you can put it in that. Yeah, Webster, yeah. And they will deliver. Thank you, yeah. And it's nice if they deliver it because shoveling that stuff is a lot of work too. <laughs> and you don't get near as much. If you've got space, definitely get some of this stuff. And it's really good on the surface. Now, to address you know, what was being asked about with Mark, uh, as far as non-organic mulches, inorganic mulches, like gravel. Um, they're not going to catch fire, and there's no doubt about that. And I think a general rule of thumb to start thinking about is some sort of non-flammable mulch between 5 and 10 feet from the house. Now, different municipalities are going to have different guidelines, and different vegetation types are going to increase or decrease the risk that you're facing there. So if you use uh, gravel mulches between 5 and 10 feet from the structure, and then organic mulches beyond that, that would probably be kind of mixing firewise with permaculture. Would you not agree, Chris? Right. Yeah, so, and we'll probably see a lot of organic mulches today. I'm jumping into the mulch thing, but since I am, organic mulches are far, far superior to inorganic mulches, to, so to rock mulches. Rock mulches kind of create a, um, a lifeless system, if you will. There's not a lot of, biological activity in rocks. Uh, but um, there are certainly places, the other thing to be careful of is if you have a lot of vegetation right up next to your structure, that can harbor things like termites as well. So you want to really, um, you know, that old adage where we want to have a hedgerow at the base of our house and that kind of stuff, we're getting away from that because we don't want to provide too much food and harboring not only termites, but, you know, rattlesnakes scorpions and all those other fun things that we have here. So let's talk about soil. And um, one of the things that's pretty easy to measure, and the master gardeners that are here, I apologize, you've heard this a whole bunch of times, but um, soil, soil is definitely an important uh, factor uh, for plant growth. And we've got a lot of different types of soils here in the Verde Valley. 
If you live in Sedona, where there's the red sandstone that's degrading, what you have is a very fine sand texture, soil texture. And what that means is that water's going to infiltrate very quickly, but it's going to also percolate very quickly below the root zone. Uh, so it's the good and the bad of it. If you lived on a clay soil somewhere, like Prescott Valley is the kind of the classic example in this part of the world, it's all clay soils there. Your biggest challenge is getting the water to go into the soil just to, per just to infiltrate, just to go from the atmosphere to in between the soil particles. It can be a challenge. And then uh, the other kinds of soils that you see here in the Verde Valley, if you're lucky enough to be on one of the old river terraces or creek terraces, that's going to be what I would call alluvium. It's probably going to be verging towards a loamy type of a soil. It's the most desirable soil, and I'll tell you why in a minute as we go. Uh, but if you live in the rim rock areas, uh, and, and what, you know, the whitish soils around, those soils are really challenging to grow plants on. Uh, and you'll notice that the plant community on those soils is very different from the other plant communities around. That's where you see the uh, crucifixion thorn. And, um, uh, well, you know, a lot of cacti, uh, Mormon tea is probably going to be on those whitish and limey soils uh, and certain types of grasses, needle and thread grass like that limey soil, but other plants do not like that limey condition. So you're going to have to think about that too. And then as you get into the foothills up in here, I, I think the soils are fairly permeable, but they're, um, and they're not overly limey, but they're gravelly. And so anytime you have a lot of gravel in your soil, what does that mean as far as water storage capacity? There's, there's, there's no water storage capacity in it. So, you know, you have to think about that. And if you dig, um, well, uh, that mark that other white bucket that I brought, do we know where that is? Yeah. It's okay. It's right All I'm looking for is that brass soil sieve. And I'll, I'll send it around. So soil texture uh, is different for all these soils. And, Soil texture thanks, is the relative proportion of sand, silt, and clay. And so, and as it says up here, that's going to have a great influence on the permeability and infiltration of, of your soil. And how does this relate to rainwater harvesting? Well, if you're passively harvesting rainwater out onto an area and it doesn't have a high permeability, then what you're going to need to do is be able to capture more water so that you can allow more time for it to infiltrate. If you're, conversely, if you're on one of those very fine sandy soils that's in Sedona, say in the village or, or in West Sedona, you know, these reddish sands that are out there, you probably don't need to build the berms and the swales as high because your infiltration rate is going to be pretty rapid. And then on any of those, you can improve um, the soil and the infiltration rate by using organic mulches on the surface. And that's a permaculture technique all the way. And we'll see some of the examples of that, I'm sure, this afternoon. I'm looking at Christmas coming yes. <laughs> And so, um, <clears throat> so first of all, how do you determine soil texture? Well, I'm sorry to say, I had a stack of 40 handouts on my, on my desk. And that's where they lie, right? This minute. Uh, but I, I can't email those to you. And what I think I'll do is if you want that handout, um, it'll have the graphs and the figures, but not a lot of the text from this. I can just email it to you as a PDF. I'd be glad to do that. I'd be, so I feel so bad about it. I'd be glad to just do it individually where we haven't captured the, Odessa's looking for an email, but I've, I've got, um, I've got tons of business cards too. So I think what I'll do is if you want that handout, I'll give you a business card. You email me and say you want the handout. I'll shoot the handout back to you. And I apologize for or that. Or you can put your email address on. I'll, I'll just send it to all of those too. Um, but um, one of the things, you can tell I'm really well prepared today. Um, 
What they show young people on how to determine soil texture, and I'm just going to put these up here for you to grab it out of them, is you just get a straight sided jar like this. You put some soil in there and some water, and often, if you're a soil scientist, you put a little caldon in there. The caldon disperses it, but then you just let it settle out. And what's the first particles? If, if the sand, the silt, and the clay are the particle sizes, and sand is the biggest, silt is in between, and clay is the smallest, what's going to settle out first? Sand. Sand is basically going to settle out within two minutes or even less of when you agitate. So you probably see the color of this one. It, it's, it's red sand. And so I'm going to re-agitate this one. And with already. I don't know if you can see it. It's settled. So this is basically all sand. It's very fine sand, but it's still sand. And so um, what, what, the, what this method does is you're supposed to measure the overall depth of what's in there, and then use the depth of the sand to determine the percentage of sand that was in there. It, it works OK, but not great. And so I've got these other ones. This one has a fair bit of sand in it. I don't really want to agitate these others. But this one has a, a different amount of sand in it. And then the clay is actually, there's a layer of clay about that thick on top of this one. The clay takes days to settle out. Well, can you tell us the locations of those two? Um, I can't tell you the locations of the other four because I, a, a previous employee put them together and he didn't oh. write it down. So, uh, but I will talk, uh, I'll tell you how to check your own soil texture. That's, that's where I'm headed, so that you can determine it. If you wanted to send your soil in for laboratory analysis, you can do that. It's, um, we've got a couple of places that'll do it for about 12 bucks. It's the University of Connecticut. <laughs> U of A doesn't do it anymore. But believe it or not, the University of Connecticut does not get mad if tons of people from Arizona send their soil samples to them. And if you go online and look at soil testing, University of Connecticut, they've got a form on there. And you'll have to pay the postage to send it back there. You don't need very much, you know, a small little bag full. But for 12 bucks, they'll do a really pretty good analysis on your soil. And they'll, they won't tell you the nitrogen, but they'll tell you the phosphorus, potassium, and other things. This is something I just learned uh, in recent times. And there's the texture by feel method, which I'll go through in a moment or two. So really, you know, we're talking about these relative percentages of sand, silt, and clay. So on this, I guess I'll use the laser pointer like it's designed to be. Uh, this is representing a sand particle, but a sand particle is only up to two millimeters in size. So two millimeters, well, a millimeter is about how far apart you can hold your thumb and index finger without touching for a, a good amount of time. Two millimeters, it's less than a quarter of an inch. It's closer to an eighth of an inch. And so anything bigger than that is not even soil, right? That's what that's saying. So anything bigger than two millimeters is not considered soil. It's considered gravel at that point to a soil scientist. And basically, it's inert. It has no ability to hold nutrients or release nutrients. It's basically just taking up space. Uh, it's not necessarily bad, but um, because soils that are armored with more gravel, that will reduce the amount of erosion that occurs to natural soils. Um, so the next particle that we're thinking about, the intermediate one, is the silt. And what's interesting about the silt is, yeah, you can look at these distances. This is soil stuff. But look at this upper end of silt and the lower end of sand, and you realize there's you know, virtually no dis difference. It's a continuum. So you might be thinking that this fine sand from Sedona is verging on being silt, but you can feel the grittiness in it. That's, that's one of the tip-offs. If you're feeling silt, it feels silky or buttery. And if you're feeling clay, clay feels sticky. It's kind of tacky. So I haven't gotten to clay yet. 
Play <coughs> is the tiniest little dot that you can imagine right up here. But the reason that it's expanded is because clay has a matrix uh, structure to it that um, looks, you know, if we could see it, uh, and in fact, you can't see clay unless you put it under a scanning electron microscope, okay? You can't see this. So it's very, very tiny particles. And so, but they're laid out like this, kind of like a, a sheet of mica. And this creates a humongous amount of surface area. I mean, the amount of surface area in a cup of clay versus the amount of surface area in a cup of sand is 100 or 1,000 times the surface area. So water is going to try to get to all that surface area. And that's one of the reasons that it's hard for water to infiltrate into clay. Because the particles are small, and they have this huge surface area, and the water want to, wants to cover that entire surface area. What compounds that even more sometimes is that clays will expand. And if you've been in uh, places that have a lot of clay, when it's the dry season, you'll see the cracks and the fissures going way down into those. And that's because of the shrink swell of the clay. Um, the closest place that I can think of that would probably have that, um, there might be something around House Mountain here, but I know that as you get down I-17 kind of by form, in the grasslands there before you jump off the hill into uh, going down to the Phoenix area. Um, there's a, the, all those flats that are grassy there are a lot of clay and they have that shrink swell uh, to them. So um, anyway, these are, the, these are the particle sizes. Big deal, right? Uh, you know, uh, I think it's interesting to note that any, the things to remember, that things that are bigger than two millimeters have no water holding capacity and they have no uh, uh, nutrient holding capacity. These on the other hand, I haven't talked about it in great detail, but the clay particles actually will hold nutrients. There's magnetic charges on there that attract certain ions and plant nutrients. So clay is not necessarily a bad thing. The advantage, well, before we go on, let's, let's just say, that no soil, uh, or very few soils, are just composed of one of these particle sizes. It's, it's almost always, I'd say 99.999% of the time, going to be a mixture of these three particle sizes. So, when you start mixing the particle sizes, this is one of the figures that I had on the handout that I was bringing. This is called the soil textural triangle. And percent clay, increases in this direction, 10, 20, 30, up to 100. And then percents, so you would read those lines going across horizontally, percent clay lines. The percent silt, 10, up to 100 on that axis, and you would read those in this direction. So there's the 30% line right there. And then the sand starts at zero here, goes over to 100, and those are the lines that run this direction. And so uh, the point being is if you can figure out two of the percentages, you can figure out the third one by subtraction, right? Now, that's how this method in the jar is supposed to work. And that's also what they do in the lab, except in the lab what they do is they float a hydrometer in there. And anybody that makes beer or wine knows what a hydrometer is, and it actually tells you the amount of suspended material per unit of water that's in there. So, not that you're, any of you are gonna do that, but it, it's kind of fun to do, and if you take a soils class or something, someday you would. But um, on the practical point, I want you to look at this polygon. This is what are considered clay soils. It says clay right there. That would be the clay textural class. Well, a clay can be as little as 55% clay, or actually as little as 40% clay down in here. That's that number right there. And it could be 30% silt and 30% sand. And that is a clay that's verging right on the clay loam. It's right on that point there. But more often than not, if they're gonna be in the middle, they're gonna be 60% clay. So that's what somebody would call a heavy soil 
and it's going to be really challenging to get water to percolate into that soil. On the other hand, a lot of places around here have very sandy soils. And a sandy loam is not uncommon here in the Verde Valley. So that means that it has between maybe, you know, uh, 65 and oh, 80 or so percent sand to be in this polygon. It's got some silt and clay in there, but the water is going to move through it very quickly. So <clears throat> if you've got these kinds of soils, it probably might make sense to harvest water and, and store it as well as using it passively. Um, you know, and, and Chris, have you, uh, you've been to a lot of rainwater harvesting uh, programs. Um, the folks over at Prescott haven't really been to an in-depth discussion of soil like this at one. Is it covered in bigger classes that you've been to? Uh, it depends. I mean, yes, you need to know your soil, but I don't know that I've ever seen it, seen anybody go into depth about uh, soil perk. Yeah. In a, at a rainwater event. Well, and, and my point being is that I think it's a critically important part, especially if you've got heavy soils. But if you've got if you've got sandy soils, the water moves through really quickly, you can amend them with organic matter and increase their water holding capacity. But anytime you amend a soil with organic matter, it doesn't stay around for more than one season. No. That's what you do for vegetable gardens here. And so we're talking, you know, you have to dig up the soil and incorporate compost in it each year. That will increase the water holding capacity of a sandy soil, but you have to keep doing it. And so for woody plants, that's not going to work. With woody plants, you plant the plant and you aren't going to amend that soil ever. I'll tell you about that at the end of time. So ideally, people really love to have loamy soils. That's, that's the, the best ticket. I think you would probably find some lonely soils on the river terraces uh, and uh, probably not very many outside of that. Um, what kind of soils have I missed? I haven't talked about basalt soils a lot. This mountain is an old volcano. It's in the middle of the Verde Valley out there, kind of on the back side of Page, on the southern side of Oak Creek there. Um, there's probably some basalt-derived soils. Those tend to be the clay ones. Um, also, the white soils that are heavy in gypsum, those white soils, those can be clay too. And, and they'll be also challenging because of the nutrients uh, or the balance of things that are in them. Not very many things like that soil. If you've got river bottom soil, that's, that's probably the best deal around here. If you've got the sandy stuff in Sedona, you're looking at water being infiltrated pretty quickly. And so you just have to think about that because once the soil, I mean, you can capture rainwater, but if it's low, if it's deeper than three feet, it's not going to be useful to a plant. Plant roots don't usually grow much between, beneath three feet. There's not enough oxygen down there to make them happy. There are exceptions, but in general, that's the little history. What about fruit trees? Fruit trees are, they're going to be two, three feet deep at the most. And so, um, yes. I used to live in Prescott Valley and I had a plum tree um, and whoever planted it put a, a rod uh, down to where I could pour water into that to surface ground. But some people do. They'll, they'll, they'll take a perforated pipe and they'll cut it in maybe two foot lengths and they'll place those. So perforated pipe is like four inch drain pipe that has big holes in it. They use it for leach fields. And they'll put those vertically, and then they'll sometimes fill them with gravel, uh, just so that they'll stay there. And you can irrigate in those, and then the water infiltrates out that way uh, into the soil. Um, <clears throat> it's not a bad practice um, if you have soil that is really hard to get water into, but it has its trade-offs too. Yes? I have, I believe it's clay, uh, and uh, I brought in two truckloads of horse manure dug it in. Uh, I have access to coffee grounds in large amounts. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been told to get stuff from the brewery. Left yeah, the, the spent grain. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any, uh, will that produce a lonely type soil? No, that? because 
what are we talking about here? These are, this is the mineral fraction of the soil. Organic amendments, you can add them, you can add them, but they're temporary. Yeah. And the, the alkalinity of our soil causes those to disappear very quickly. Well, I've been told yesterday, uh, we've been throwing away this stuff that comes off of juniper trees and pine trees, and someone said, no, dump it in. The soils are so alkaline, they can don't, it. don't incorporate it into the soil, but it makes great mulch. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, moving on. So this is, if, if uh, anybody so desires, I've got, uh, this is a flow chart on how to determine soil texture by field. And it, I'll just kind of paraphrase what happens. <clears throat> you put a, uh, a tablespoonful or two of soil in your hand, you moisten it just to get it moist. And then you squeeze it, and if it holds into a ball, then you keep going down this way. If it doesn't hold together in a ball, you've got yourself a sink. That's your soil texture. But if it holds in a ball, then your next step is to try and ribbon it. And you ribbon it between your thumb and your index finger like that. And I'll be trying to demonstrate out there, but I don't want to, you know, you'd have too much time here. Um, and depending on the length of the ribbon, if it's one inch or one inch or less, you go down this trail. If it's one to two inches, you go down here. And if it's two inches or more, you go down this one. And so uh, it's unusual to find a soil, well, it's unusual in the Upper Pike County to find a soil that will rip in more than two inches. That's a, it's, it's a very heavy, more of a clay soil, as you'll see. And then the last thing you do is get some soil and you really wet it a lot, so it's like soup. And then you feel it in the palm of your hand. And if you feel grit, that's sandy. If you feel slickness, that's usually, um, that's gonna be the silt. It's, if it's buttery and satiny, and that's very smooth. And then if neither uh, smoothness nor grittiness predominates, it would be a clay. So a sandy clay, a silty clay, or a clay would be your choices if it ribbons that much. Conversely, if it only ribbons an inch or so, then you've got sandy loam if it's gritty. You, if it feels smooth, it's a silt loam, and if neither predominates, it's just alone. So it's really pretty, it's, it's pretty hands-on. I brought the stuff to do it, but I didn't bring the handout that you can take home, but I can email that to you if you, if you want one. It's, it works really well. So uh, the amount, all of this to say, the amount of water that can be stored in these individual soil textures, you can see the difference between unavailable water and available water. Well, up here, when we first water a soil, the forces of gravity carry the water down through the soil profile. And when it's fully saturated and gravity is still draining it, it's, it's, it's wetter than, you know, than it should be, I guess. But once the forces of gravity have acted on it and the pores are filled with water or air, then that's called field capacity. So that's this upper line. So that's as much water, plant available water, as the soil can hold. And then at some point, there's still some water left in the soil, but plants cannot extract it from the soil. And the soil, in this case, it would appear dry, but if you oven dried it, it would lose even more moisture. You could weigh the difference, but you can't really see the moisture on this unavailable water part. And in a silt loam or a loam, the distance from here to here is greater than it is on the sand. And on the clay, it starts decreasing a little bit too. So that's just to show you, you know, these loams and silt loams are great, uh, but you've got what you've got. So the amount of water that you can hold, if I had sandy soils on my place and I was trying to grow woody plants, I would focus my attention on harvesting rainwater and storing it because you're gonna be irrigating much more frequently on those. There's not as much storage, there's not as much plant available water. Conversely, if I had some soils in this area, I'd probably focus my attention on passively harvesting it. Okay, real quick. Um, th this chart is on the handout that I forgot to bring, but I can email it to you. And uh, available water per inch of soil, and then available water in inches per foot. 
So, in a foot of soil, if it's a sand, you can only store less than an inch of water. And a loam, let's just pick a loam, that's times four or five. So, you can store over two and a half inches of water in the upper foot of soil if you have a loam. And so on. And, and then it kind of decreases down here again. Um, so it's kind of, this is kind of interesting too. And when you're thinking about water storage in your soil, the upper foot is really where the action is. That's where the most biological activity is going to occur. That's where most of your plant roots are going to be, especially if you're growing perennials or, or vegetable crops. So I'm going to blast past that. And <clears throat> now this is the amount of water that a soil can take on in inches of water per hour. So if you have a sand or a sandy loam, we never get a six inch rainstorm in an hour around here. Uh, very rarely if we ever do. But this just gives you some example. And I don't know, oh yeah, this sandy clay goes with this one. So we can take on in a clay loam, silty clay loam, between two tenths and six tenths of an inch per hour, which is pretty reasonable uh, for this area. And, and those are the kinds of soils that we often have. Um, so anyway, just another little piece of information. And when you think about that, that's going to tell you what opportunities you have. Um, and it also shows you that if you have a sand, you might not even need to install rainwater harvesting. <laughs> Unless you want to, unless you have some objectives that you want to direct that water to certain areas to grow certain plants, and there's certainly I, I'm I'm arguing for that, not against it. I want you to harvest more water. Uh, I threw this in just to show you. This is a when a raindrop hits bare soil. This is what happens when the soil is saturated, and all of this soil that gets gets thrown up like this is now part of the flowing water and no longer part of the matrix, and so it can wash off of your property. This is an argument for mulching and uh, protecting that soil surface. Now, if it's a rock mulch, that's fine, but I, again, I think organic mulches probably are more plant-friendly and more sustainable and probably uh, a better thing to use when you're outside of your firewise zones. So, you know, this is a straw mulch. Um, there's lots of different kinds of mulches to use. I think I've spent enough time talking about them. Um, but really, when you use an organic mulch on your soil surface, it's slowly breaking down, right, at that interface between the soil and the organics, very slowly. But it is contributing some carbon over time, as well as all those other benefits of reducing, reducing evaporation, um, just holding the water there, holding the soil in place, reducing raindrop impact, and so on. So I'm coming up on the end of my time here, and there's all kinds of reasons to use organic mulch. Here's a few others. Um, I, I really, I think gardeners should really think about biodiversity in their gardens. I think the more kind of critters you've got hanging out in your garden, probably the less uh, angry little bugs you'll have or uh, things that eat uh, your plants, your desirable plants. The more diverse it is, I think, uh, the more natural enemies of pest species you'll have. Of course, you'll also have more snakes and other things, you know, the food web. If you have a lot of insects and things that eat insects, then you're going to have uh, more biodiversity in your garden. Certainly, the mulch prevents weeds, too. One of the things to be aware of, uh, it, these landscape fabrics, everybody thinks, okay, I put this fabric down, it's permeable, I put gravel on top of it, I'm good to go. Well, do weeds start growing through those fabrics? They do, because on the surfaces of those gra the gravel, there's some dust and, and soil gets down in there. So I'm not a big fan. I used to think landscape fabrics were pretty cool. I'm not a big fan of them anymore. Um, they have their place. I certainly don't like black plastic on soils. That really limits the gas exchange. And, and it, I think um, it, it, it just uh, it kind of makes the soil more anaerobic, you know, in the absence of oxygen. And you really don't want that. So um, 
anyway, it can protect plants from freeze damage and so on. I mean, I thought of every reason I could think of there in Reno. You know. But uh, moving on quickly, the one thing that I like to tell people, and the, the, again, the Master Gardener volunteers that are here have heard this before, but when you plant a plant, uh, a woody plant, don't amend the soil. Don't amend the soil, just loosen it. And the nurseries will tell you, amend the soil, amend the soil. When you amend the soil, all you're doing is repotting the plant. So if you use the native soil, put mulch on the soil surface. And so I'm going to run through really quickly these steps. So notice the hole there is wide and only as deep as the container. You want that container sitting on solid ground there, but you want the native soil loosened up right here. And you want rough sloping sides here. You don't want them to be shiny and slick. Uh, where the idea is we want these roots to go outside of this container, go through this soil, and they'll get used to the native soil here, and then they'll be able to colonize the real native soil that hasn't even been loosened up over time. Then your woody plants are harvesting rainwater too. They're putting out roots out there, and they are able to capture more natural rainfall. If we had amended this soil, then the roots would concentrate where the amendment is. That's just the way plants are, the path of least resistance. We're all that way. Uh, so, no organic amendments in the backfill. And this has been proven by science. It's just not me standing up here. Peer reviewed research has showed all, shown all over the nation that using organic amendments in the backfill for planting woody plants is a mistake. Um, you also want the root ball on undisturbed soil. You really don't want this root ball settling down. And it, the old adage is twice as wide, right? Yeah, everybody's nodding. And what happens when you loosen the soil, the amendment is we've already talked about decomposes and goes away. So your soil volume is decreasing, the plant's sinking, and then what will happen is the soil surrounding will start coming in and inundating the part of the plant that's really supposed to only be above ground. And, and once you start getting soil, evergreens are really sensitive to this. If they get water, if they get soil and moisture this far up their trunk, farther than they're supposed to, they'll start dying. It takes them about five, six, seven years. But then all of a sudden, once an evergreen starts dying, it's hard to turn it back. Um, organic mulch, we've sung the praises of mulch and uh, no unnecessary pruning. So the more branches that it has down lower, uh, the more photosynthate it's going to direct towards making the trunk bigger and adding taper and allowing the tree to stand up without staking and hopefully you might only you might find a plant that you don't even need to stake. So that's just a little tidbit of information uh, that was taken from a whole publication about planting. Um, the one last thing I forgot to circulate this around and I asked Mark to bring it around. This is a two millimeter sip. So I'm going to pass it around. If you put soil in here and something won't go through those holes, Guess what? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's not soil. So that's the end of my presentation. And I, we've got time for the vendors to, we were planning on uh, what a desk of, well, as much time as we need. And um, I'm available, you know, all kinds of ways. Email's a good way. And what I'm going to do, since I forgot those handouts, is make sure that anybody that wants one, that has email, can get one. And if you need me to mail you one, I can probably do Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, Adessa, um, do you want to orchestrate the? Yes. I okay. Just talking to and I, Okay, and I might. Um, why don't I turn the lights back on and turn the projector off? Is that going to work?